Hi, everyone. My name is Ellen McGird. I'm an editor at Fortune, where I established the Race and Inclusive Leadership Beat way back in 2016, when I had way more trust in the world. I'm so happy to be invited back to Aspen Ideas Festival. I love every second I spend with you. We're going to be talking about trust today. And for the purpose of this conversation, I'm going to ask that you trust me, because we're going to learn that nobody trusts journalists anymore. I want to take a minute to uh, introduce our panelists, and we're going to kick right off here. Um, I'm going to go from the from the, the, the end to up to up to Richard here. Uh, we have Dylan Tyson, the president of Prudential Retirement Strategies, who has joined us at the last minute to weigh in on trust and business and the role of business in the community. Next to him is Merit Jana, who's the non-executive independent chair of MasterCard. So we're gonna hear a lot about financial inclusion and from the board level, and also um, has an extraordinary role in Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. So we're gonna be learning a lot more about the, um, the role of, of academia and, and research in helping us figure out the metrics for a more inclusive and trustworthy world. Next to her is uh, Tom Wilson, who's the CEO of Allstate, who um, has been talking, uh, we've been talking a great deal about developing a purpose-driven business and um, what that means for him. He has strong things to say about ESG and the role of a business in society and has an extraordinary framework for how he makes big decisions um, about how he and the company should weigh in on the big issues of the world. And next to me is probably someone you know quite well um, who is going to be talking to us, kicking us off in our conversation about trust today, um, Richard Edelman, CEO of Edelman, a global communications firm. He's both a company CEO and a person who CEOs trust. 22 years, he's been collecting data about who, what institutions are trusted in the world. It's an extraordinary body of work and has become a foundational conversation point on trust, which is the currency of the modern age of business and stakeholderism. Um, Richard, I'm gonna to throw to you to kick us off, please. Okay, great. Um, no film? We're good to go? Um, okay, let's go. Um, I wanna start out by um, giving you some sense of the last 22 years. Francis Fukuyama studied trust, was the first academic to really um, do this, and his theory was that uh, great legal systems enabled trust and that the United States was fantastic in the 90s, that it was the triumphal period of the US, capitalism was ruling and you know we'd beaten Russia and all these things. And what's happened is that his presumption that um, institutions function is wrong now <laughs> and the world's changed. Um, so when we started doing this research in the year 2000, it was right after the battle in Seattle um, when the NGO stormed the World Trade Organization meeting protesting globalization. And so we decided to study NGOs, media, business, and government. And we found that NGOs were the most trusted institution. And that sustained uh, for 19 years. And then it changed uh, in the pandemic. In 2020, government became the most trusted for a shining moment um, and then collapsed. Um, and then business has become the most trusted institution in the world, which may surprise you. Um, but to my left is Tom, and um, increasingly, you know, CEOs are being asked to look at and ask um, questions of how do you how do you manage your portfolio of issues. So that's really the basis of the conversation today: business and society. Um, so let me get to some important slides. The first one is there is no basis for peaceful discussion or debate, and that is leading people to have a tendency to distrust. They go into any situation not believing. You have to prove the fact before you can move forward. Also, it's really important that there's no place to have civil debate because it's too politicized. Second, societal fears are exacerbated. I want you to see that the number one fear is job loss. This at a time of 3.5% unemployment. Why? Automation. People can see the future of financial services, retailing, et cetera. Sustainability, race, et cetera. But fear levels are high despite a, a good economy. It's a bit of a kind of conundrum, but people have a little PTSD from what happened in the rapid response in the pandemic when unemployment levels went to 15% among certain populations, right? People of color got fired, <laughs> put it where it is. Um, I want you to see that 
there are substantial, and I mean substantial, gaps in trust between the countries that are in autocracy and the democracies. The systems that work best deliver to their people. That's why China, India, Saudi, etc., have very high trust levels in their institutions, lesser in the West. And in particular, I want you to see, though, the large gaps between the top quartile and the bottom quartile of income. Countries like Germany used to have a three-point delta, now have 28. So it started out in the US, UK, and France, 2015, 2016, injustice, Brexit, Macron, Trump, <clears throat> now has become transversal. Thailand has a 35-point gap. Saudi Arabia, 20-point gap. They're not going to have elections anytime soon, but the point is, you know, there's real sense of injustice. Business is the most trusted institution. Government had a good period, but it was all based on escalation of the elite's trust in institutions. The mass was flatlined. The next slide is the most important one. I want you to see the difference between business and NGOs, government and media. The least trusted institution in terms of competence and ethics is government. Media, a bit better, not great. Business, 53-point delta versus the poor performer of government on competence. The word competence matters hugely. I trust institutions that get things done. That's why I trust business. NGOs have an edge on ethics, less on ability to perform. Now, this is where it starts to get important for business. All stakeholders, from consumers to investors to employees, are holding business accountable for societal issues. This is really important. I'm an employee. I'm only going to work for you if I feel your values are reflected in mine. That means you have to stand up and speak up. Consumers are belief-driven buyers. Brand democracy is ruling. I will buy brands if, for example, they get out of Russia. Otherwise, I won't. Investors, on an individual basis, two-thirds say that they invest based on values, but the most important statistic in our institutional investor study, they say ESG is equally important to operational excellence and financial performance. Now, even if you want to discount these numbers, as I see Sneel um, wrinkling up his nose a little bit, fair enough, <laughs> um, it's an important fact because it wasn't like this two years ago. It was at 40, and now it's gone to 88. Okay. Six in 10 choose their employer based on belief. So it's not just belief-driven buying, it's belief-driven employment. Take a look at the things that people mention. I'm not going to work for a business where I disagree with their stands on societal issues. I really want them to listen to my views on issues. And I also expect, because my employer is actually my number one relationship. Look how trust has moved local. This is a fundamental change. Trust used to be top down, the Moses model. Then it went horizontal, peer to peer about 10 years ago because major institutions failed, it went societal. So what's happened in the last three years, trust has gone local. Gen Z, we heard this morning at another Walton Family Foundation panel, their number one relationship is at their workplace. It's not their church. It's not their political party. It's the expectation that my workplace and me are kind of intermingled. So again, my employer is put into the place of having to stand up, speak up, because trust is local. That's where I feel I have the most control over that relationship. I can quit or not. Societal leaders are distrusted. I want you to see that the number one is scientists, people with data, but then second is coworkers, which implies that horizontal peer-to-peer, -peer, but also you know local. Um, my CEO, look how high my CEO is relative to CEOs in general, mm. just about 20 points. <coughs> my guy, then national health authorities, et cetera. Look who's not, government, journalists, and CEOs. 
So you get the sense. Classic leaders are distrusted. The new leaders are trusted. This is shocking. My employer media is the most trusted form of media. On information about the pandemic, the newsletter from, for example, Columbia University was the most important source of information because people didn't believe the right or the left. Media is seen as deeply politicized, chasing clicks like this. <clears throat> now, you might have thought that there was a limit to what people want from business. We're just in, this, in, the, in the field two months ago, asked this question, is it too much? Are they going too far? Do you want more or do you want less speaking up about race or climate? Look at it, pretty well, the gaps are four or five to one. We want more. We're not getting what we want from government and we need you. Five to one, do more. And now geopolitics is added to the agenda. So if you think of business as a juggler doing its classic business, meaning you know, economic responsibilities like make money, Societal responsibilities are almost now at the same level as economic responsibility, race, etc. Look at geopolitics, and in some countries it's even in the 70s. So three balls, harder to juggle. <clears throat> this is a really important slide. CEOs are expected to be the face of change. I want my CEO to be personally visible. I expect my CEO even <coughs> to address controversial societal and political issues. Also, I do not want um, CEOs to wait for government. I want CEOs to lead. For example, in the question about the obvious, starts with a C, ends with an A, which American address, China. Um, if you commit human rights abuses, I expect you to sanction that government by pulling your business out. If a country threatens our national security, whichever that is, however, don't wait for government to impose sanctions, get out. That's why 1,300 companies have left Russia. In fact, 38-point decline in your trust if you've stayed in Russia, 31-point jump in trust if you pulled out of Russia. <coughs> so, in short, the role of business has never been larger in our world. And the question is, have we come to the logical extent of what's possible? Can the other institutions grow into mm -hmm. filling that void? Can government recover? Can NGOs speak up more effectively? And can media get back to its place of authority instead of click chasing? With that, Madam Moderator. Thank you so much. That was depressing <coughs> and very Sorry. interesting. Those are actually the list of questions, <laughs> <laughs> one right after the other. But I, um, why don't we, I feel like I, we absolutely have to start with the CEO, um, the role of the CEO first because it's so powerful and in light of everything that's happened from, from guns to Russia and Ukraine and now Roe v. Wade, we are all looking for someone. Unfortunately, it's, it feels like the great man theory writ large all over again. It doesn't feel sustainable to me. The only option I feel like I have is to throw to the CEO on the panel. You are not my CEO, but you are my insurer, so I absolutely <laughs> do trust you. <laughs> you have a fascinating and really clear framework for how you make these kinds of decisions, but I think we do need to talk together as a panel about what this means for CEOs and what this means for leaders in terms of how they navigate this with their employees in particular, but with all their stakeholders. So Tom, could you walk us through your framework, please? Uh, sure, um, but let me first say, uh, like I don't think it's just us. No. Like I don't think CEOs are gonna fix this problem all by itself. Um, I think Richard I absolutely agree. Gave, gave us a gift here, which is that trust is the big problem. Uh, it's, it's driving the polarization, it's driving yep. the anxiety. It's more important than control of the Senate and more important than $5 or $6 gas. Like we need to fix this. Uh, and what I think it says is that um, trust is first. I think we have to reframe our thinking about it. So a lot of times it's like, oh, well, I run an insurance company, so we should do X and we want people to trust us. And I think if you think about every institution, not just businesses, uh, they have to really think their first job is to have trust. Get trust, then you can go do something else. But until you get trust, none of this is going to work. So we have to kind of reframe it. It's, and in our business, it seems so obvious because we live on trust, right? Like you pay us in advance, and if something happens, you trust that we will help you. Uh, so for us, trust has always had to be first. But now I see it. Other institutions really have to reframe their thinking so whether you're a government official, a politician, running an NGO, it's okay. What are we doing to build trust? 
then figure out what you're going to do, mm. as opposed to what am I going to do and how do I have trust along the way. So I think it's we can't do it by ourselves. Um, I do think it's uh, it, it, it is a lot for businesses to do. So uh, Ellen, you asked about our framework. So I kind of got uh, you know it's, as a CEO. Um, People are always asking to sign some letter. It's about bathrooms. It's about this. It's, they're all important, but like you know, like how many letters you're going to sign uh, before you're just another name on another 100 letters. And so you try to be focused. Uh, and so uh, about a year or so ago, the incoming got to be so big. I said, okay, we need something to sort this out. So we created something called the Societal Engagement Framework. Uh, and it kind of goes like this. First, it has to pass our values. So whatever somebody's asking us to do has to be kind of consistent with the way we run our business, which is not a surprise. Uh, but then uh, we say, okay, will it help us do a better job for our customers? That's the first filter. If it gets through there, do we know anything about it? Uh, if it gets through there, do we have any agency? Can we actually affect any change? And then if it gets through those, what are our employees and what is our impact on our reputation? And so that helps us sort through where do we want to take a stand? So, for example, if you were to do uh, climate change and wildfires right up our alley, right? They're burning down our customers' houses. Yep. Mm. Uh, we know a lot about it. We can get states things passed in California and work with legislators and regulators to get stuff done. Uh, and it's in our employees like it as well because it stands well for us. There's a lot of other issues which don't fall through there. So what we did was we took 104 issues, we put them through there, and we said, uh, if it's related to climate change, privacy, uh, or uh, equity, call us. Uh, that's where we'll lead. A bunch of other stuff we'll support. Like we're not against the other stuff, but we want to. And then we went out and communicated that to your point, Richard, on shareholders. We said, you know. BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, who own you know about 30% of our company in total, we said, hey, this is what we're doing. Right. Like, so if somebody complains and wants to do a consumer boycott because we're not doing something on teaching standards in Florida, recognize it doesn't make it through our filters. So the distinction there is because abortion is part of your healthcare offerings, you communicate around what has changed around those offerings and what you are continuing to support, but that's an employee issue. You're not lobbying for anything. Yeah, we did on uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, we said, do we want to go make a public stand and lead on it? Uh, and, uh, you, and we said, doesn't help us with our customers. I said, we don't sell health insurance. Uh, and you know, there's a wide range of opinions. We don't really know that much about it. So we said, we'll deal with it with our employees. So our employees uh, we cover it in our health care plans, as we always have. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they can't get to that kind of treatment where the state they're in, then we pay for them to go someplace else. But we don't, we choose not to lead on that one. Right. So, because I think if you ask businesses to lead on everything, you're going to lead on nothing. Right. And But showing your work and being transparent and having a process clearly makes a big difference. Merritt, when we were earlier on preparing for this conversation, you made a, a, a wonderful observation. And of course, anything from this material that you hits your ear and you want to talk about, please do. But you talked about trust as being part of a global company, and that it shows up differently around the world. And it's a hugely enormously uh, complicated challenge, even around data collection. We know that when it comes to um, uh, diversity and inclusion, but around norms and around um, making sure that uh, leaders who are responsible for a global business understand how, how everything operates in various markets and decisions you need to make. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that challenge for business, building trust that way. Surely, thank you. Ellen, pleasure to be with you. It's my first Aspen Ideas, and it's a, it's a wonderful format and very good topic, so thank you. Um, well, look, I've been a professor of international economic law and policy and, and worked with um, in government and I have the privilege of being on MasterCard board now for six years and chair since uh, January. And if I take the MasterCard example, it's, it's really an amazing company. It, it's a global um, technology and payments company that operates in over 200 markets. Yeah. Um, around the world. It's a, a leader, an innovator, um, and it's trying to empower economies. And, you know, it thrives if economies thrive. Uh, and, if, and if people are uh, able to operate well and utilize increasingly a sustainable digital economy. So when I think about, um, you know, where 
trust reveals itself in this kind of global network. Uh, first, of course, the values of the company are very much associated with this whole concept of financial inclusion mm. and, uh, and also the safety and soundness of that digital ecosystem. So, uh, you know, we talk a lot about uh, cybersecurity, about building norms around data governance, about norms around uh, AI. These are things that have to do really with building out this digital ecosystem. And, and the world is taking non-uniform approaches, but they also have to be interoperable. And you have to have confidence that if you're using that card or any number of <coughs> rails, uh, you know, that it's going to reach the other party, that right. there won't be fraud on it, you know, there won't be hacking and so on. So those are th investments in that uh, ecosystem that I think are very, very important for, and also reaching people wherever they are, mm -hmm. uh, all over the world, uh, and bringing more people into the economy uh, is, is part of the mission of, of this company. So I think you build that trust by being clear about the values of inclusion and growth, by showing that you're an innovator, and then also making sure, I like very much, I, it feels intuitively right to me, your analysis, Richard, that people identify with their companies because their companies can reflect their values and can deliver. On, on their commitments um, or, or and, and so I'm seeing that particularly with MasterCard when it talks about sustainability, it can show that it means it in its uh, strategies around people, around the planet and around fostering inclusion and prosperity. Uh, on the question that Tom speaks to, I like your framework and I think many companies have developed their version of it and, and I, I support that way of thinking, which is, you know, find the areas around which you have uh, actual competence, uh, where you have legitimacy to address, uh, you know, those uh, dimensions where it matters to your employees and to the communities in which you operate and your investors. The farther afield you get from that, uh, the more challenging it becomes. That's not to say that companies aren't under more and more pressure to go there, and Richard's been analyzing that, but it seems to me that, 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 that CEOs uh, and boards need to think about where uh, can they speak uh, with that competence, uh, with the support of their employees, um, and with the ability to affect change. Before I, Dylan, before I get to you, Richard, I, I want to ask you, I know that you don't, you're not in the prediction business, but you do have an extraordinary ability to look ahead based on your experience and the data you have. And I know that CEOs are, are not the answer necessarily, but we're looking to them unfairly to do so, and these frameworks are going to become more and more necessary. What could derail this moment of my CEO trust going forward? And I'm, I'm guessing that there's going to be, if you, if you look at the demographics within companies, it, it's going to be broken down by race, it might be broken down by, by prospect within the companies, but what, is, what can tarnish this moment for my CEO and trust? I think failure to deliver on promises, and business made a big promise after the murder of George Floyd, and we are out of the field a month um, from a study uh, where it's clear that the bloom's off the rose for the African American and Asian populations. They feel specifically that business has been a lot of this and not enough do. And it's also actually blamed on the human resources officer. Yeah. The trust levels went from quite high to quite low, like 20% trust in the CHRO now. So it's even more pressure on the CEO to have to be the one who has to now deliver on um, promises. And I think the other is a recession, which is, probably going to come, whether it's in the U.S. straight away, can't be sure, but in Europe you can count on it, and what happens is job loss, and then business gets blamed. So those are the two things that are going to be problematic. Ellen, you know, I, you said unfairly. I don't think it's unfair, okay. actually. I think, you know, CEOs make a lot of money, you got a lot of responsibility, you control a lot of resources, like you should be expected to do some stuff. Like, I, I don't, <laughs> I think it's more than just making money. It's, you know, it's, you got to walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I think there's something Richard mentioned earlier, too, which is um, 
which is going to be digitization of and job loss, not just recession, but you've mentioned this before. Yeah. And let me see if I can get you there. So uh, trust comes with competence. It also comes with intentionality. So, uh, and that means does the other person willingly accept something somebody else is doing to them because they think either A, they have empathy for you, B, they're not gonna take advantage of you, and C, you have a mutually beneficial relationship. So that intentionality is really important. And let me give you an example of where, this is, it may help, I don't know, Richard's thing. I've been struck by the whole China thing. Like, how can China be like 80%? Like, I don't trust China at all <laughs> on anything, It's right? just the Chinese trust themselves. Well, but I think, well, that's, I think that's right. It's so if you have competence, we all, China's whatever level of competence, like every other government, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, but then you have intentionality. I think their intentions are bad, right? Like I think they're trying to subjugate people, I think they're you know, stealing IP, they wanna be a world power. If you're in China, you don't think their intentions are that bad. So hence why my reputation for China would be low. So I think when we break that trust, that intentionality with our workers, and it's gonna happen, like I'm just, the digitization is ripping through uh, at least the services business uh, and computers can do it faster, better and cheaper. Everybody likes it, the customer likes it, everybody, except the person whose job now is done by some bits and bytes. And so I think that's a challenge, which is why we need these other institutions to get their act together right. and start working on trust and not just working on some policy. So like what politician is really expressing intentionality, like for half the population they do and half they don't, like that's just dumb. No, but that's actually the problem I'd like you to solve, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it fits our framework. I think, I think MasterCard's got that one, okay. or maybe Prue. We're I gonna, think Prue oh, no, we're that gonna one. Go to, we're gonna go to Prue. Prue, you, Dylan, getting to know you has been really such a delight. Prudential is 145 years old, based in Newark, but also you have a huge imprint around the world. You've been a global leader too. Um, but you know some things about turmoil. Right, you've been a quiet leader in, in stakeholderism for a long time. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about um, how this plays out for you in, in, in your career, but what you see is working that we may not have, have that may not be picked up um, by, by me or anybody else in the media, because that, some of the stories are pretty extraordinary. Well, I think the first, the first point I'd like to make is um, being able to differentiate between success and significance is really important. Okay. To be able to be super clear for us on why we do business, why we would attract employees to, to be with us, what we stand for, and to speak with ever greater clarity on that because the world's a noisy place. People don't have a lot of time to think about it. For us, this is making lives better and it's expanding access to investment insurance and retirement security. And it's living our values, making sure that people understand that we're committed. We're committed to a place like Newark, which was our home and which was the founding of, of, of our story. Prudential, Prudential was born a purpose-driven company. We, we were born to be able to bring insurance to middle-class families when it was only available in, in Newark, um, when it was only available to people in New York at that time. And this is a stand that we've stayed through 145 years, through the riots that happened in Newark in 1967. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it's a community that hasn't all the way come back yet, even from that time but that hasn't meant we've given up. We, we think about, and in fact, we think that there's so much promise in what lies ahead and that we have to have a significant role to play. In the research, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, we're ta talking about two things, trust and competence. And I think the way that the business community has leaned into and affirmed some of our most important values, um, racial equity, the, the integrity of voting and, and our electoral process and said, no, we can't be silent on this. We have to talk about that. That's helped us in terms of trust and it's what our society needs. Mm -hmm. We've always been um, on our best days competent. That's business was kind of put in place to, to have good systems on that. And I think people wanna be part of this to win. So overall, those are, the, those are the ideas that we've got. One last thing that I would just say, we have business resource groups these are, sometimes people will talk about them as employee resource groups. What I think here is the platform that we make sure that it's not just um, the smartest CEO, but really that the, you know, the smartest CEOs, what they're doing is figuring out how do they create platforms so that the voices of all of the employees are really heard and part of the solution. Those are the things that, that I think. Richard? 
I think the part that we haven't really addressed sufficiently <coughs> is the battle for truth. Yep. And I think that government and media are a bit in a death grip at the moment because <laughs> it suits politicians to have heat because it gives them pun raising. It suits media to have clicks. Um, and that death grip is mutually reinforcing because behavior A leads to behavior B. Trump tweets, we cover it, we get more circulation, leading to more people wanting to follow Trump like Bolsonaro. And I think in the next phase, the media has got to be the one to break it off in the relationship. Has got to say, we're not going to cover these tweets. It's not news. She's the media person. I am. <laughs> it's easy for I, me we to like say. Her, it's yeah, easy for me to we say. We like you. Yes, we thank you. And I said I'd cover race and leadership and equity. And you know, I'm, I'm happy for my tiny little platform here. And I'm going to hang on to my chair as long as I possibly can. But I want to make sure that we get some questions or comments in from all of you. We're really looking for solutions here. I'm about to ask them more about stakeholderism and how to, how to, how to accommodate more people. I'm looking around. Anybody? Oh, me. Thank you. Um, great discussion. Um, I love what you said about Prudential. Um, I think that... Omi, could you, rec could you tell us who you are, please? Oh, yeah. I am Omi Bell. I'm the CEO of the Black Girl Ventures Foundation. Uh, we work to create access to capital for black and brown women. Um, I was taking some notes because I think the idea of the CEO leading is interesting and what we need them to do in leadership. When you make a decision, which was a great one that you made about Roe versus Wade, um, then you did lead. And I think sometimes we forget that part. Like that was a leadership move, mm -hmm. right? So that was you taking a stance, that was you taking a, a role. And I think what we're saying as consumers is that business can no longer stand by while we bleed and work for you every day mm -hmm. and not take a stance or not say anything. So I love what you said. So my question for you, for everybody is, are you a classic leader or are you a new leader? So, and can I build on that? Because I really want to, this, that's actually on my list too, is that what are the characteristics of a new leader? And what does that mean to be an established person that needs to get up to speed? And does that mean that we can find new leaders out there through different filters? I think that's a really important point. Who would like to take that? Can I give that to you, Merritt? Uh, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> Dodge the bullet I, I, I don't know what is an old new leader or new leader. I, I don't. I, I don't really know the answer to your question. I do think that um, uh, I like the the notion these days that being an inclusive leader is necessary in the world today. It's necessary in your company. Uh, it's necessary in our, you know, very diverse United States and world. So. Uh, to me, that's very, uh, very important. Uh, I have come to appreciate more and more this notion of values reflected in what uh, you're actually doing. And so there's sufficient transparency around it so that your employees and your community can see that it's not just talk, uh, that it's actually real. That if you're talking about you know, gender pay equity, you, you publish your data and you mm -hmm. say, here's, here's what my company's doing. Or, you know, if you want to create, uh, you know, support um, different communities, you know, you have programs, people can evaluate them, et cetera. We have a million metrics running around uh, these days. And I do think companies should be able to develop the metrics that make the most sense for their business, their community, and so forth. But there also, and this is something we were talking about earlier, there also need to be, you know, evaluation of those. Are they real? And uh, there's where I think the academy could do better uh, in thinking about some of the things that are developing in the name of ESG, um, for example. But, you know, leadership can take many forms. So um, there's some great leaders in history. What is a new leader? I'm interested in what others say. You know, I, could I, let me maybe take a shot as well um, in building. So um, certainly CEOs have a responsibility, have to lead, and people lead different ways. Uh, but uh, I like to believe everybody's a leader in some way, shape, or form. Uh, sometimes in your family, sometimes in the boardroom, sometimes with your coworkers. Uh, and uh, as it relates to trust, I think we all have the responsibility for leadership. And uh, my own definition of leadership is somebody who can 
gets people to willingly go someplace they wouldn't go by themselves. So willingly go someplace you wouldn't go. That's what a leader gets people to do. Uh, and you're all leaders. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this stuff is done in pots. It's, so like we're looking at culture and what do we do with the hybrid environment and that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, we've got you know, 53,000 employees. Like you don't just put out something from the CEO and everybody says, oh, that's the culture. It's done in pods of like eight to 10 people. Trust is the same way. So you have a circle of people who trust you. You have a circle of people you trust. Expand your circle, right? Like be in, show intentionality. You know, have, have empathy for their point of view. Like, welcome them in. You know, establish norms around it so that, you know, my norm is that if you got a point of view, I'm gonna listen to you, and maybe you're right. I'm pretty sure I'd like my point of view as well, but, you know, maybe you're right, and we'll find out in the end. So I think establishing norms, taking leadership for it, if we all take ownership for expanding trust in our pods, we don't have to wait for the President of the United States or the head of some government uh, entity or university. It doesn't mean we don't need them to get there. Totally with Richard on that one. It's their job just like it's my job. But I think trust is in our grasp. We all know how to give it and use it and do it. And we need to like step up. And when you hear stories like, I forget what the numbers Richard might know, there's something like it's over half people have like huge fights at Thanksgiving right. over stuff. You're like, right. how can this be? We need to all embrace trust more because if we don't embrace trust at the, that level, the local level, it'll never roll up in total. So I think, yes, I'm accountable, we're all accountable, but so is everybody out here. Ellen, I think also we haven't talked about the power that brands have, not just corporations. And brands have huge budgets and brands that are like Dove standing up for women's self-image and I saw uh, panel this afternoon on, on um, you know, basically stopping uh, influencers from body shaming and just cross them off if they're doing body shaming. One, one influencer literally had a test of, you know, can you tie your Apple uh, iPod uh, cord around your waist and if you can't, you're fat. That's disgraceful. That kind of person needs to go. And, and, and you know, you need brands to stand up and do this. Similarly, when um, a certain president uh, was talking about Kung Flu um, and the sales in uh, Chinese restaurants plummeted. You know, one of our clients said, okay, good, we'll do a program with you called Take Out Hate, meaning if you then ordered food from the Chinese restaurant, um, you were fighting anti-Asian hate. Great, that's what you should do. If you have brands, do it. Hi, Pete. Uh, uh, Peter Zahn with Futures Unbound. We're a San Diego-based philanthropy. Um, and I appreciate uh, all states' uh, framework for identifying issues to advocate on. But I think equally important is the strength or conviction of the advocacy itself. Um, and something actually that we're struggling with is uh, on climate change, uh, we know that there are a lot of banks, large banks, that are funding fossil projects to the state in, in huge amounts. Um, to, to really be serious about climate change, we really can't tolerate that, and, and we shouldn't be doing business with those banks, and that's something, we're still using a, a Chase credit card, and I know uh, Bill McGibbon has been listing the, you know, the funders and banks that have been, been the biggest lenders, and Chase is certainly among them. Are, are, is that something that you're you know, willing to or, or have those strengths of conviction as a company, I don't mean personally, uh, to really pursue once you identify those issues that you realize are important to the company? So uh, we have about a $65 billion portfolio um, and uh, we're uh, building and rolling out a climate investing strategy uh, because we think uh, it's the right thing to do for uh, the world uh, and we think we're gonna make a lot of money in it because uh, businesses get paid for fixing problems. The uh, world's got a problem right now that it needs to go from brown to khaki to green uh, and we want to be part of that movement. Uh, on the defunding part, I just don't think it'll work. Uh, I mean, you know, I if you don't have the banks doing it, there's so much money in these markets that uh, somebody will fund it. I'd rather say, let's come up, there. John Doerr did this great thing on the transition plan. If you haven't, I haven't read his book, but he's like, it's, it's, it's the transition plan. Fund the transition plan, because if we shut down all the oil and gas in the country today, 
like, you know, we've got 25 million cars we insure. Those people like to go places, uh, and they can't afford a $65,000 electric vehicle. Uh, and so I think we have to fund the transition. So I think funding the old stuff, totally agree. We don't do much in, like, the old, like, oil and gas stuff. Like, we don't think there's any future to it, so we don't fund it. But other people will do it, so I don't think defunding is the answer. I think funding the transition is really the answer. Let's fund where we want to go as opposed to where we don't want to be. I was just going to add one footnote. You know, I think, um, again, coming out of the MasterCard experience, you know, they have developed science-based targets for their own scope one, two, and three, you know, that they're transparently uh, developing metrics around. And, you know, they're also developing a priceless planet coalition on planting trees and developing, you know, new uh, technology data infused uh, startups and also metrics that you can use to see your own uh, consumption and environmental impact. So I say look at what, you know, creative companies are doing uh, also to support this transition. I think there's tremendous creativity developing uh, around environmental transitions that is actually part of this exciting moment, I think. By the way, in terms of philanthropy, I, I don't know this to be true. My guess is the transition is going to hurt the less well-off more than the well-off. Mm. It's generally been true. So if I was a philanthropist, I'd be thinking, how am I going to help the people who are going to get crushed by this transition? Yeah, bam. <laughs> like maybe I got ideas. <laughs> Hi, my name is Loretta McCarthy. I'm the CEO of an investment firm that invests golden seeds. We invest only in women entrepreneurs. Um, and I just want to say, I'm thinking about Richard's data at the beginning about trust, which implies that it does say that many employees trust their CEOs. So I'm trying to square that, Richard, with the other data that is so much in the marketplace about employees not being loyal to companies and what leaving every two or three years. They just don't like to stay places a long time. How do you square that data? The reality is we have an overheated uh, employment market, and especially for tech. And the, the impending change in economic circumstance, I think, will cure that. Uh, the expectations of CEOs starts with employees. Trust is built inside out. And this is a huge change. You know, employee communications used to be like way down the hall. <laughs> nice to talk to you at the end of the day. Shareholders, consumers, because we've got to sell products, you know, like this. Communities. This completely flipped in the last four or five years. Started with Me Too, murder of George Floyd, now on sustainability. Employees have a serious voice in what companies can and should do. They've got to be listened to. At least, I, I love your, your process because you actually also go out and listen to employees as part of your frame. It's not just you telling them. You said it's bottom up and top down. We're almost out of time, so we're going to have to go to have the rest of this conversation happen in the wonderful mingle things that happen here at Aspen. But for the lightning round as we say goodbye, I wanted to just follow up on not necessarily the, the, the new leader idea, but the idea that um, stakeholderism is also about sharing power that has never been shared before. That's the part that really hits my imagination in an optimistic way. So because you all work with and are serious about financial inclusion and serious about working with stakeholders who just haven't been overlooked before but have absolutely been shut out of the conversation about their lives, that's what financial inclusion is, um, if you could sum up in sort of a high-level haiku-like way, what have you learned about sharing power with groups or organizations or people or entities who aren't inclined to trust you? Dylan, over to you that the, the first principles, the way that you think about it, you really have to open your mind and invite the conversation in and be very conscious and deliberate about that um, because by, almost by its definition, it takes a change in mindset. Yeah. And for us, a lot of those ideas come from our business resource groups and the voice of people who aren't at the top levels of leadership and, and having set that up is paying really good dividends for us um, and I think it would for other people as well. Thank or you. Is. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm not trained in haikus, so <laughs> I might struggle a bit with this, but you know, I think there's a lot of room here for innovation. 
Uh, and part of it is reaching those communities and sometimes creating partnerships uh, with other entities, sometimes governments, sometimes cities. You know, you have to find where the trusted partners are and for companies who have the capabilities, whether it's data, technology, creating new mechanisms, experiment. And I think, I think there's a lot of experimentation that's going on in the context, I think, of maintaining a, you know, real decency and approach and clarity of values. When you take the risk and trust them, uh, they develop more confidence and it becomes sustainable. We took the risk on doing a MWBBE, a total minority debt deal, $1.2 billion, no white firms need to apply. Uh, they came back, they, they did a great job, uh, and they now have the confidence and they're doing it all over the place, so uh, well beyond us. So if you trust them, they will have confidence and it will be sustainable. My haiku, Gen Z is the key. Pretty lame, but oh, um, very good. <laughs> it was quick, you know. Brain, brainstorms can be better. But the gravitational pull of Gen Z is stunning, and they are 70% uh, societal or politically active. Um, they believe in we, not me, and I think we can learn a lot from that group. I love that. Seek to be trusted. Be innovative with trusted partners. Trust them first. We, not me. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for this wonderful conversation.